Uh, may I please ask the esteemed panelists to join me on the stage and, and I, will, I will tell you a few words of why you, you're up for a very, very special evening with this, uh, this uh, fabulous trio. First of all, President Ilves, uh, two-term President of the Republic of Estonia, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, former Member of European Parliament and, and very commonly referred to as the the man behind the success of the Estonia or the digital society that we managed to build in Estonia and has received multiple awards uh, on that theme. Mr. Peter Westerbacher, uh, one of the best known Finns in Eurasia. Uh, <laughs> his, his claim to fame um, that you might deduct from the colors is that he's been involved in some relatively unhappy birds uh, as the as the Mighty Eagle of, of uh, Rovio, which was the company behind Angry Birds, the, the phenomenon billions of people carry in their bucket, pockets. And, uh, and he's now dealing with some new ventures that uh, we're going to talk about today. And uh, Mark Yale, uh, who's, who's uh, uh, behind a global index looking at the competitiveness in financial centers around the world and, and has dedicated more than a decade of his recent uh, professional activities on that topic. So. So all together, we, we plan to dig a little bit deeper into the topic of cities competing to each other. So gentlemen, thank you. And I would, I would love to start briefly uh, like opening up a little bit more of your personal relationship to the topic of city competition and the topic of why we're sitting in London right now. So President Hilvas, um, <laughs> You've lived a life around the globe. Um, after your term finished in Estonia, you're now residing in Stanford University in California. So both sides of the Atlantic, northeastern corner of, of, uh, of Europe with Estonia, the west coast of US, a lot of travel. What does London mean to you? Like, what, why are you here? When do you think about, like, oh, I need this competence or skill? Like, when do you think of London? Well... <clears throat> Unfortunately, because I'm not that rich, then I don't really th think about what I need from London, but I always have thought of London as uh, the major financial center of the world. I mean, it is number one, so it's not even just right. in, the, in the area, but it's number one in the world. So, I mean, what I associate with London is that. Uh, and then the second thing I probably associate it <clears throat> with is the is how London voted in, uh, on the 23rd of Jan June, 1916. So what happened then? 16. What happened? What do you mean? Well, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about uh, domestic politics here, but certainly, uh, but certainly when, you have, uh, when you have an international city, it's, it's, uh, its population obviously thinks internationally and uh, therefore has a different attitude than Say, than outside the city, and uh, I think that in London one is uh, keenly aware of the international ties that, upon which the success of London as a financial centre rests. Does, uh, does London hit your radar also in, in the sense of digital businesses, and like, like talking about not just banking but fintech? Well, and mainly in the sense of transfer-wise, as another Estonian company located here, which is one of the, I mean, the originally really successful uh, uh, company uh, and the original company to actually take advantage of the new technological possibilities of uh, of uh, the digital era, which we are keenly in. And if you don't think we're in the digital era, then look at uh, read the Saturday's Saturday's Guardian on uh, what uh, Cambridge Analytica did. Uh, I mean, this is this way: if democracy in the future will not be the same uh, in the digital era, and so too. Uh, I mean, the innovations <laughs> pioneered by transfer-wise and copied by other companies now as well, and which, as I understand, lies at part of, is part of the business that uh, LHV does, is uses that model. Uh, that, um, I mean, if, if it's here, this is where it's going, where the financial center will remain, uh, regardless of the political changes. And I would just end up right now by saying, I think in general, uh, when we talk about uh, finances being location neutral, then in fact everything is location neutral. I mean, just to take a completely different realm, you know, we have something called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. 
that's, I mean, that, that is based on the old kinetic models of warfare and defense. I mean, it's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because, you know, tank logistics, fighter pilot ra fighter plane range, all these things that from the founding of NATO to the present day has been very important. It remains important. On the other hand, when you look at the digital threats that we face today, uh, where you see the same same hacking groups uh, attacking elections, not only in Europe, but the United States, but probably beyond there, Mexico most recently, then you realize that the threats that we face today are completely location neutral because, I mean, the internet just takes you anywhere you want. And we have to start thinking in all realms, every single realm, we have to start uh, understanding that in the digital era, where you are, I mean, this physical distance is no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. Um, where, which offers a lot of opportunities, but also a number of threats to, uh, to people. Thank you for this introduction, which, which bridges Peter to you very nicely. Like, if the location doesn't matter, why are you digging that hole? Yeah, yeah. So, and maybe so, you want to tell people what... Yeah, so, so basically, uh, left Conlac day-to-day operations at Rovio and Angry Birds a year and a half ago, and uh, one of the projects I'm working on is I'm connecting Helsinki and uh, Tallinn with this uh, little tunnel, so it's like 100 kilometers under the sea, and uh, basically uh, makes uh, distance, uh, kind of like the physical distance uh, between Helsinki and Tallinn much shorter, because you can get from uh, the Tallinn airport to the Helsinki airport in 20 minutes. And uh, of course, uh, the tunnel itself is not the important thing, but it's, it's the uh, change in mindset and, and kind of like the whole like uh, mental shift that that enables, because uh, uh, of course, location uh, matters. You could say that it matters less and less that you, you are independent of location. But uh, even with that, uh, I think that uh, talent density uh, matters. Uh, so physical talent density. And of course, if you look at uh, Helsinki and Tallinn, kind of like uh, separately, you know, we're doing okay. But together we can do pretty much anything. So uh, all of a sudden you have a metropolitan area that is uh, much bigger than Stockholm, much bigger than Amsterdam, and uh, we expect it to be uh, the fastest growing metropolitan area in all of Europe uh, for like the foreseeable future. And, uh, and I think that uh, then uh, we get into very interesting discussions that uh, while other people uh, are doing, you know, like Brexit we already touched on, and then of course if you look at, you know, like what Trump and uh, the guys are doing in the US, building walls and, and uh, um, working very hard on, on like keeping uh, people out. I mean, one example, last year, uh, the number of Indian students in uh, the U.S. Uh, was uh, uh, going down 26%, and it's continuing. So uh, you're not bringing the talent in, and uh, of course we know what will happen. I mean, not immediately, but when you're starting to turn talent away, you're not going to do very, very well. And I think that uh, we'll see the same kind of thing here. Uh, so uh, if you're not attracting the talent, you're not going to do fantastic and, you know, financial center or not. And I think that uh, this is, again, uh, what we have a uh, massive opportunity because of all the stuff going on elsewhere. Uh, Helsinki and Tallinn can really take a uh, much bigger role. And, uh, of course, our friends in Estonia have done uh, the most advanced kind of like digital society, digital government anywhere. Uh, so uh, in Finland, we're working hard to kind of like catch up. And then uh, I think working together we can do even better. Uh, so, so I think uh, then another thing, of course, that we have a superior geographic location. I mean, I get on a plane in Helsinki and six hours later I'm in Beijing, six hours later I'm in Delhi. So we're at the heart of Eurasia. So our home market is five billion people, 70% of the world's population. So uh, I think it's like a pretty good place to be. And of course, uh, the future is Asia. And uh, what I always say, uh, you know, here that what's I Beijing, Beijing, Dashu, Asilo, Baga, Chin, Chi, Du, Han, Yu, Dan, Shu, Wada, Han, Yu, Hai, Bu, and Mei. So uh, I spent eight weeks in Beijing studying Mandarin, and that's why my Mandarin is not yet perfect. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's something. How many here speak Mandarin? Okay, we have uh, like one. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah. So uh, I'll probably continue in English, but but uh, uh, but, but the, the interesting thing I uh, I always ask this question, and I mean, and the thing is that if you want to know what's going on in the world, you have to understand what's going on in China. I mean, there's no way around that. I mean, just as simple as that, and and it always amazes me on like how 
little. I mean, everybody understands, yeah, it's a huge market and yada, yada, yada. But how many actually have taken the time to understand what's going on there? And not like, okay, yeah, now we have like she forever and like all of that. But that's like the surface. I mean, you have to understand what's really going on. So last seven years, I've been going to China uh, twice a month on average. But as I mentioned, it's easy, six hours and I'm in Beijing. And soon, you know, I get on a train in Tallinn, 20 minutes later, I'm at the airport, six hours later, I'm in Beijing, six hours later, I'm in Delhi. So superior geographic location still matters. But th this is a fascinating point. I, I want to earmark that, is that, that in that sense, connecting Tallinn and Helsinki is one thing, but the location of Helsinki didn't change. But, but if you notice what he just did, all of a sudden Helsinki is not the northeastern corner of Europe, as I tried to provoke in the mm -hmm. beginning, but, but like it's, it's a very often like keeping the cities where they are, keeping the talent density where mm -hmm. it is, like you can redefine the box around you, right? Yeah, we're drawing our own maps. Exactly. So, so the thing is that, uh, I mean, that's, that's uh, very important. But, but I, I think that it's always kind of like a matter of uh, perspective. And, and of course, I mean, we're talking about a globe. So, you know, you can look at it from many, many different directions. And, and you just like, of course, put yourself in the middle and then you can like take it from there. But one, one thing, uh, I mean, of course, background in games industry. So we now have the highest uh, density of game developers, games companies in Helsinki. So not in London, not in Tokyo, not in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and I think that this is something that, again, it's an example of like uh, what can be done if you can like uh, work together. And I think that there's no reason why we can't do the same when it comes to kind of like any kind of talent. So uh, besides the tunnel, we're also now working on a project bringing 150,000 uh, uh, foreign university students like from outside of the EU to Finland by 2020, 30,000 to Estonia by 2020. Uh, so we're uh, very, very focused on increasing the talent pool and, uh, you know, give it 10 years and you'll see amazing things. Thank you. And bridging with Asia to mark your work with the, with the, with the um, Global Financial Centers Index. When I pull the latest, and I understand there is a new research coming out just next week. Next week. So the one that is currently online, um, top 10 contains cities such as Hong Kong. Financial centers contain cities such as Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, Shanghai, <coughs> Beijing, and topping them all is London. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about the methodology and the work that you're doing, and how do you compare these cities? and And is this an accident that these Asian cities are, are sort of are they standing still, or are they coming up there, or what's up there? Um, I don't think it's an accident at all. No. I, I, Far from it. Um, we study over 100 financial centres, have been doing so for 15 years. This is number 22, and as I say, number 23 is coming out next week. Um, we look at well, two main sources of data. One is an online questionnaire that goes to three or 4,000, or we get three or 4,000 respondents from senior people all around the world based in financial services. They are financial service professionals, um, and they're qualified to talk about the financial centre where they are and the other financial centres where they do business. We, I won't go into and bore you with the statistical methodology, but there is quite a lot. But we also measure or gather a hundred different, over a hundred different measures of what we call instrumental factors. These are measures that anything from levels of corruption to tax levels to qualities of living to healthcare provision. Um, transport infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, uh, over 100 factors supplied by the World Bank or the OECD or whoever it might be. We mix them all up in a big statistical engine and we eventually come out with an index. Mm -hmm. um, London and New York have typically been the top two and um, they vied for number one spot. We measure these cities or we, we put them on a scale of 1,000 and frankly they're only... I think this time there's one point between them. So actually there's, there's nothing between them. There's nothing statistical between them at all. Um, they compete, but they also um, cooperate. Uh, what we have noticed quite clearly, and if I could show it very clearly on a graph or if anybody wants to see it later, if you compare London and New York over the last 15 years, in terms of their perceptions, they've been pretty flatlining. They really haven't, if anything, they've come down a fraction. Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, when we started, were well over 100 points behind London and New York. They're now less than 20 points behind. Um, nearly all of the news, um, 
about the moment is the long-term trends of Asia. Mm -hmm. It's not just the Chinese centers. Um, Seoul has come on leaps and bounds. We know obviously about Singapore. Um, Asia in general is the place to be. I'm there in two days' time. I probably only go there once a month. But, um, so you know twice as much at least, probably hundreds of times. But um, I have to be there. So, but if you look at the data sets that you control or, or gather for this, uh, is there anything particular? For example, Peter made the point about the talent density. Is that what's driving those cities there, or is it something else? I think it's a combination of factors. It's my my fudge answer, if you like, but it, you know, it really is. I mean, I don't think anything ever um, is reflected by a single factor. I think it's the level of um, innovation, certainly. Um, but don't forget, the, possibly the largest single factor is just the growth of the market. I mean, the amount of money that's there. Um, if you look at Chinese economy 20 years ago, it's been growing at a faster rate than virtually every other economy on Earth um, ever since. OK, that's slowed down a little now, and they're only predicting 7%. But, I mean, most European countries would, or, or US cities would love 7%. Um, so, I mean, you know, there is a massive um, increase in wealth. Sure. And that money has to go somewhere, has to be used somewhere, and has to be invested somewhere. So, I mean, that's a huge factor. But levels of innovation um, and the Chinese way, the determination of wanting to have a slice of the action. President? I was going to say that, of course, it's... I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> the role... Uh, cities actually have developed, um, or one reason why cities have, I think, risen in prominence is actually the, the entire urban environment. I mean, Richard Florida is the, uh, the uh, academic who studied this the most, but it's not simply the financial, financial services, it's also all of the cultural innovation that goes on <laughs> in those areas and you can, um, I mean, you just find this over and over again that when you have a, when you have an open, generally liberal, uh, uh, urban environment, doesn't have to be quite urban, I'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, but where there's all kinds of interaction. I mean, uh, another way to look at it is why is Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley used to be the Santa Clara Valley. Um, uh, and the if Valley of the Heart's Delight. If you look at the development of what is today Silicon Valley and why it's absurd when every, I always laugh when someone says, oh, we want to be the next Silicon Valley, is that the environment was actually quite unique. I mean, first of all, you had all the geeks in the artificial intelligence community and, and Hewlett Packard at Stanford University. But let's keep in mind, how did, you know, how did uh, Steve Jobs uh, get into like doing this? I mean, he dropped acid uh, as a hippie. Uh, and all, and you had all these other guys who were re in, who were like living in Silicon Valley because it was cheap and warm and nice, and they were the kind of hippies. So if you read the book by John uh, Markov about the development of Silicon Valley, you see it's, it's actually an interaction between the geek culture and the counterculture that spawned all of this innovation that came about. And then, okay, why well, I said it's, it's not quite an urban environment, but it's pretty close. Uh, and, but what the thing is the l amount of interaction between different cultures. And I find that the cities that are exciting to be in where you see all kinds of innovation coming out. I mean, we leave out in Berlin, for example. I mean, it's not a big financial center out of where it rates at all. On the other hand, it, ha it was in the 1920s, and, and it was actually West Berlin during the Cold War. And today, all of Berlin is, again, a, a bubbling cauldron of artistic uh, creation. And so there's more to cities than simply being a financial center. Absolutely. I, I think the clearest example here is sauna. Like Talsinki would be an awful, miserable place in the, in the winter if you didn't have the saunas. Mm -hmm. And when TransferWise builds a new office in London, they put in a sauna in London, obviously. <laughs> so you can see how the culture, culture moves. But one thing that I, I notice when all of you are talking is that we barely mention nation states. Like, like it's, I know the title was about cities, but uh, do, do countries matter? Like, is there a role in sort of this development in these hubs, these places where people want to be? What's the role of countries, if any, in that, Mark? Like, um, We've done a fair amount of research vis-a-vis um, -vis capital cities or important major cities versus the hinterland, if you like, the, the rest of the country. Um, you don't need to have a hinterland to be a successful city. 
certainly not a financial city. I mean, Hong Kong is basically, sorry, well, Hong Kong, but Singapore in particular, is basically a city state. Mm -hmm. um, there, isn't much, there isn't much else apart from the city, let's face it. Um, London's share of UK GDP is huge, um, and that attracts um, a lot of the international wealth and international trade, but also people from other parts of the UK. Um, could London exist by itself? Well, personally, I'm not convinced because I think um, cities still need quite a lot from nations. Um, they can't exist completely in isolation. And um, a lot of them do funnel an awful lot of um, investment from the hinterland, if you like, from other parts of the, of the country. Um, but there are some very good reasons why um, cities by themselves can't just break away from countries. So and I don't think there's a compelling reason why they need to. So before we, we get your case for <clears throat> why our country is good, um, Peter, how are you going to fund the, fund the tunnel? Are the countries going to pay for it? No, I mean, basically, uh, uh, like uh, any venture, if it's uh, a good business, uh, it's pretty easy to fund it. So I think that that's kind of like the starting point. And then, uh, of course, I mean, if you look at uh, like all the money in the world currently, I mean, then uh, there's a lot of that, as we already heard in China. And uh, then uh, this tunnel happens to be uh, kind of like along the Belt and Road project. So, uh, yeah, it's quite likely that uh, there is big uh, interest from China to fund a uh, big chunk of the tunnel project. It's like 15 billion euros, so it's, it's uh, kind of significant. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the basis for all of it is always uh, that it has to be a good business. Otherwise, you know, why would anybody fund it? So, so I think that's, that's important. Then, then on this, you know, like cities and, and, uh, and kind of like nation states and all that, I, I don't think that it's, it's kind of like either or. I mean, it's, it's very complementary, and uh, I think that's... Uh, also, um, and of course, I mean, uh, if you started from scratch, I mean, London could stand on itself just like Singapore can, and, and there's kind of like no problem there. But I think that uh, you can't kind of like ignore history and, and, uh, and uh, you know, where, where we come from. But uh, I, I think that uh, cities uh, are where the action is. So I think that that's where uh, most of the innovation happens. And, and again, uh, talent density, I think, is like super important. I, I don't think that that is uh, going away. That it's just, uh, um, you know, as simple as that. That then, when you have lots of people together, you know, then you kind of like you bump into random people at the coffee machine or you know at the local Starbucks or or what have you, and it's just less likely that that happens if you have less people. So, so I think that uh, innovation kind of like needs a bit of of density and. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that the role of the cities will will definitely be um, bigger uh, going forward, and, and I don't see any change. I mean, of course you can work anywhere, but then I would also ask, like, why would you? <laughs> President Ilves, imagine you were an imaginary head of state of an imaginary country, and you met the local mayor of a bustling city. What's your pitch? What's your value proposition? How would you explain what does a state do for cities and the people in it? Well, I mean, there are certain functions that, unfortunately, in this world, you still have to... I mean, the cities have a hard time uh, meeting. I mean, it's, I think it's important to keep in mind that, the, the, that Singapore, in 1964, spent 60 percent of its GDP on defense. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, because when it became independent, it was not exactly, it was not a wonderful environment. And they were actually worried about these things. That's what states do. I mean, unfortunately, you can be, if you're a city, uh, you're not going to go far if you, don't, uh, if you don't have a state performing the functions that the state performs, either in diplomacy, I mean, you, you need ambassadors, you need embassies, uh, or in defense. Um, you know, sometimes I think this metaphor of, oh, we'll just sort of break off and do our own thing uh, goes a little too far. I know there are a group of people around Peter Thiel who have this idea that the, you know, the, the U.S. coast or whatever, the territorial waters end at 12 nautical miles, and then at 13 nautical miles you're going to put up a sh ship that's filled with high-tech entrepreneurs, and they don't have to be bothered by the 
you know, paying your taxes to the U.S. government. <laughs> On the other hand, what do you do when a submarine, you know, surfaces next to you and says, Dobre <laughs> Um I mean, this is, uh, you, I mean, cities need states. I mean, unless you become a city state. Uh, and the other problem is that if you have cities or urban areas that ignore the, the rest of the country, uh, as I would argue, certainly happened uh, in the U.S. in 2016, where you had basically the, the Bosch Wash uh, urban center from Boston to Washington, and then you had the kind of the California, San Francisco to L.A. strip, uh, which produces indeed much of the GDP of the United States, but I mean went off in a completely different area, and everything between, uh, with the exception of a few urban centers like Chicago and Denver and Austin, Texas voted for Donald Trump, I mean, that's what you end up having. And I think, I mean, I think Brexit also, in some senses, though I'm no expert on British domestic politics, I mean, I think is partially a result of very different development between the city of London and maybe some other urban uh, centers. And then the, what should not, I mean, if you call it the hinterland already, <laughs> you are already making a political mistake, I think, that breeds a certain antipathy toward urban centers. I was deliberately using the word to be slightly contentious, but I completely accept your point. <laughs> yeah, Mark, Mark, have you, like, do you see, for example, do the cities in your list that, uh, that uh, rank higher, do you see them taking more responsibility <coughs> of the area around them or sort of trying to be the glue <coughs> of a larger area? Or is um, there a connection? Some of them take finance or draw finance from other parts of the economy. But I mean, there are lots of countries and lots of financial centers that actually don't really contribute to, and the extreme examples, of course, are the Caribbean islands, the Cayman Islands and things, and the British Virgin Islands and even Bermuda in the fields of um, insurance and reinsurance, for example. They don't really touch the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go uh, half a mile outside um, or even a few hundred yards, literally outside um, the centre in the Cayman Islands, and the indigenous population are still living under corrugated iron with a few very malnourished-looking chickens running, scratching around in the yard and things. It, you know, it's not a wealthy place. None of the wealth that could or possibly could have accrued in places like this has touched the rest of the economy. I think Russia is the best example of that. We're outside of, I mean... Yeah. Basically, you have this huge country, and only 15% of the GDP is generated outside of Moscow. Yeah, I mean, 15, so one five. One five. Yeah, yeah. And there are lots of examples of that. Um, and certain countries are now becoming, when they're looking at developing or redeveloping their financial centre, they're becoming much more socially aware. They feel they have to become much more socially aware to prevent some of the um, friction that otherwise will accrue between the indigenous population and the wealthy few, many of whom, or a large percentage of whom, will be international people, because you can't really have a successful international financial centre without international people. Um, Casablanca is a great example. They took over the old airport because a brand new international airport was built outside the city, and the, the airport, the old airport, was right in, in the centre. And so they've got a 700-acre plot that they're basically using as Casablanca financial centre with a view to attracting a lot of business and almost being a conduit to Francophile Northwest Africa. Um, but they've been extremely careful because it butts up, this, this area butts up against some fairly low-income deprived areas. They've been extremely careful with the nature of their social housing so as to avoid conflict with the Arab way of life, but also with simple income levels. And I think that this is a, it's a differentiator, if you like, between cities and the rest of the country. Um, but it's also a way that the two almost have to interact. So speaking of interactions, there is, this, um, there is a th thinker in this space uh, of, of sort of global mobility and, and economies that uh, uh, called Par Kana. He's a professor at Sing in Singapore. Um, and he has written a book called Connectography, 
And one of the theses he makes, which I love for the sort of visual clarity of that, is that his claim is that the maps of the world are drawn wrong. Like if you look at the typical map, way too many pixels are wasted on the borders and virtually no pixels are used on the connecting lines. So like if you sit in an airplane and you take out the, so the, the booklet from the, the pocket and you open this map, uh, which shows you where the airline goes, it's kind of exciting. Like, like you, you see immediately on that map uh, uh, that the, wh which places matter and which places are better connected and where they're connected than, than people and capital and ideas and all these other good things flow. So, so what could be that glue? Like, like how could these cities connect to each other? Like we can dig tunnels, obviously. But is there anything else, like European Union, um, United States, like these formations that are supposed to bring larger groups of people together in ex examples like, like American politics and, and European politics right now, it would be easy to make a case that it's, it's not doing its job, kind of like what? It... Well, I mean, clearly, uh, I mean, I think the Schengen area to, to which the UK just never belonged, um, however, did a great job uh, of that in continental Europe, mm -hmm. uh, making it much easier for ideas and uh, people carrying ideas to move back and forth. Uh, and then again, I think the what is the real disruptor is simply um, the digital world. And here we can see some of the limits of it as well, because the absence of a digital single market, though we've, we're taking small steps in that direction, but the absence of a digital single market in Europe, uh, where actually borders still matter. I, my wife lives in Latvia. I can't buy an iTunes record for, for her from Estonia. Uh, I mean, that, whereas in the United States, I mean, that, that problem, again, is, is dealt with. I mean, you do have a single market. Uh, I mean, there's a, I mean it's okay, there's a single market in Europe for, for, uh, <clears throat> for goods, but it's easier. For, to take a, bo uh, take a bottle of wine made in the Algarve in southern Portugal and sell it in, in Sweden, north of the Arctic Circle, than it is to buy that record for my wife. So the, this, is a, the, he, this is where the borders really do impede development and for all of the European Union. Uh, and this is something <coughs> you might want to consider next year uh, in March, uh, that uh, things don't move so well. Uh, and then again, on the other side, it is precisely the the sort of being in the digital era that you can eliminate these differences or these. I mean, you can move ideas very quickly, um, and that's. But that's also threats also move instantaneously, right. just as the good things move instantaneously. Right, Peter. Like, besides going to China yourself, like you, you're behind some of very active communities in Finland, like Slush, for example. Mm -hmm. Like which are yeah. optimized to bring people across this border. Like, tell us a little bit. About yeah, that. I mean, like with, with Slush, I mean that's now the world's uh, biggest uh, kind of startup community. So we started that in 2008, and actually, uh, you know, like uh, everybody else wanting to be like the next Silicon Valley. So we made it very clear that we organized this in November in Helsinki. So it's cold, it's dark, there's slush on the ground. So it's very clear that it's not the Silicon Valley. It's better. And it's much better because it's different. And I think that that's something that we want to do from the beginning that we, you know, you can't really like lead by following. So we need to do kind of like our own thing. And uh, we're fine with everybody else wanting to be the Silicon Valley of this and that. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, they're right. And, uh, but uh, we're, we're trying to make something that will be uh, much, much better. Uh, but I, but I think, still think that... Uh, and that what's the scale of that today? Like where you studied and what... Is yeah, it? I mean, we, yeah, right now, I mean, we have these physical events, 20,000 people, uh, typically in uh, November in Helsinki from like more than 100 countries. We have 2,600 volunteers from like 60 countries uh, building last year. We also now have uh, presence in Shanghai, in Tokyo, in uh, Singapore. So again, this like Eurasia uh, focus in, in everything. And, and, uh, and, and that actually brings up also this... Uh, uh, I mean, from our perspective, there's only kind of like uh, one uh, country between and then we're in China or then we're in like India. So, uh, so I think it's, it's uh, a lot of it is, is kind of like mental that the physical distance is actually uh, not that long. And also, uh, you know, like when I'm in China, you know, like just explain that we're actually the closest neighbor of China in Europe. And we're also the closest neighbor of India in Europe, closest neighbor of Japan in Europe. And, uh, and then we also happen to have like uh, lots of daily flights to not only like Beijing, Shanghai, but also places like Xi'an, Nanjing, uh, Chongqing, uh, Guangzhou, uh, and so on and so on. 
So uh, and Fukuoka, so not only like Tokyo and Osaka and, and these places. Uh, so I think the physical connections are very important, but even with that, that you have to overcome this like mental like barrier. And I think that uh, it's just that people have this perception that, oh, it's Europe, it's far away. You know, that, uh, you know, and, and I kind of like experienced this myself. So I was in uh, Thailand uh, actually last year, uh, January on, on vacation. And then uh, rest of the family flew back to Helsinki and, uh, and I flew to, uh, uh, to Beijing. And it took me, uh, it was like uh, five hours and something from, uh, from uh, Phuket to, to uh, Beijing. And then, uh, you know, from Helsinki to Beijing, it's like six hours. Uh, so it's, it's not like that different, but mentally it's, it's very different. And it was interesting, one of my friends is running this like Beijing International School Expo and saying that they had this plan to start taking Chinese families to Thailand to look at the international schools. But they actually had to give up on that idea because the schools in Thailand are already full of Chinese people. So they can't accept anymore. And, and it's again because of the perception that oh, Thailand is next door, you want to escape the pollution in like Beijing and Shanghai. Shanghai. So typically, you know, then uh, the one child and the mother typically they move to Thailand, they put the kids at school there and then, uh, uh, you know, the husband come and goes there for the weekend or, or something, but it, because it's like close. And Thailand is not known for having like the best schools on the planet one like us in Finland or Estonia, so we have <laughs> best schools on the planet. So then when you think no, about no, this... <laughs> no, we have the best schools in, uh, outside of Asia, actually. Right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, yeah, actually we have better because uh, Asia, uh, the Asian model uh, is uh, not very healthy. So, But, it, but anyway, it, it doesn't create happy people. Uh, so, so uh, but that's kind of maybe another discussion. But, but the point here is that, that there's no reason why you wouldn't do the same that, okay, let's, you know, put your kids in school in Finland and then you can like just do the, uh, you know, commuting between, uh, for example, Beijing and Helsinki or Shanghai and Helsinki. You know, it's physically about the same. And everybody in Finland speaks English. You know, English you can actually understand. So, so, uh, so I think that uh, there's a lot of this kind of thing that, that it's just the perception that, oh, it's not Asia, so it's far away. And, and I think that this is something that, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, talking about education students, a uh, lot of uh, students from uh, India and, and China go to Australia. And then you look at the flight from Delhi to Sydney, it's uh, 12 hours and, uh, you know, the flight to Helsinki is half that. So, so, but again, you think that it's okay that it's, you know, Australia, it's not, you know, like it's kind of like Asia. So I think, so mental maps still matter a lot. I don't know, I wrote an essay many years ago about mental geography, but some more updates on that. I mean, I think that we, there is a problem in that people really haven't gotten over their old ideas of the way things are. Mm -hmm. uh, one example I bring of this was, uh, since you raised the education, was about four years ago, Prime Minister Cameron made a speech. I mean, two things happened once. Prime Minister Cameron made a speech saying that he's going to put a stop to the end of all these uh, all of these uh, East Europeans moving here. And then the same day, the PISA scores, uh, which is the OECD study of school performance, uh, came out, and that was where Estonia and Finland were six, number six and seven in all the other countries in the world, and all of the countries be, uh, the, in front of us were either Singapore, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, and so on. And so I put these together, uh, and uh, I put together, oh no, East Europeans coming, PISA scores in UK set to rise. <laughs> um, because in fact, the, the, uh, in fact, I think one of your yellow newspapers said, you know, uh, UK scores even be below even Estonia. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is, but I, on the broader issue of uh, mental geography, I mean, one of the things that you see is that people, I mean, just as you think that China is so far away from Helsinki, or from Europe. I mean, so too, in general, I mean, th things are very different than they were, say, during the Cold War, but people still think in Cold War terms. And you think, you say, like, my country gets this a lot. It's kind of like, oh, East European, poor, backward, and so forth. On the other hand, it is by far the most digitally developed 
uh, country in Europe. Um, and maybe the only competition at all we have is Singapore. And if anyone's interested in this, because we're always boasting about Estonia, don't take my word for it. Google The New Yorker and then The Digital Republic, which and it has this long, long article that appeared uh, well in December, written by an American who went there, extremely skeptical, and then you get this long article in The New Yorker, which is the premier magazine of the United States, on how it all works. And then you can see that it's not my word, but someone else who initially started skeptically. But mental geography is important because we tend to think of places in the way that, um, <clears throat> we d that people did 25, 30 years ago, even though there's this been amazing revolution, just, and first of all, with the way we used to think of China, but I mean, all of Eastern Europe was, you know, gray people living in gray, gray, leading gray lives in gray apartment blocks. That's not the case anymore. It's very different. Uh, and so mental geography, I think, is also a block in many ways, or old mental geography is a block to investment. You think, oh, that's like that. But no, it's not. It's not like that anymore. Um, and uh, so this is something that I think also investors need to overcome. And I think also in terms of what is going to be a financial center or what is not going to be a financial center is something that, sh that should be looked at far <coughs> more sort of in real time rather than in uh, sort of uh, paleo time. Imagine there was a search engine that would tell you things about which cities are great to live in. Imagine that. Yeah, so then <laughs> then <laughs> who's, who's doing that? <laughs> hmm. yeah. uh, there are plenty of cities, plenty of measures of... City, exactly. the standard of living and all, all sorts out there. But, but Mark, I, I wanted to box you a little bit more of uh, being the local panelist, like, uh, as opposed to thinking of the global You're going to ask about Brexit now, aren't no, you? No. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of asking, like, you just heard that the, that, uh, that the, the pitch for why you should go to Helsinki is that it's, it's uh, dark but and actually, slushy. And I think it's Helsinki and Tallinn together. I think yeah. that's something that Helsinki. we Sorry. also need to kind of like, uh, start talking about because it, it really is one metropolitan area. Like five years from now, we'll have the tunnel and then it's like there. But yeah, exactly. anyway. Yeah, so Talsinki is cold, dark, and slushy. Being in London, what's your what? It's how no would difference. you? <laughs> Today is no different, but it's really cold but, out there. <laughs> but but let's let's say I don't allow you to say food. What's special about London? Why should companies and people come here today in 2018? Well, food here is okay. <laughs> Yeah, you can eat quite well in London, not because of the English chefs, but because of all the international ones that are fantastic. Um, there are a number of factors, and if you had have asked me about Brexit, London isn't going to disappear, however hard the deal is struck or not struck. Um, London has a number of things that keep it a great city. Um, it's been trading as the centre of initially of, of an empire for hundreds of years. It has um, a history, almost consistent innovation. Yes, we have all of the Asian centres. We have Berlin and Barcelona and quite a number of other um, innovative cities. But London is still terrific. Bear in mind some of the other things that London won't lose even if they leave the euro. They've still got sterling. They've still got the English language. They've still got um, the availability of skilled labour and, and <coughs> with the English language. And they're still in the European time zone. And time zones are something that we haven't really covered, although we've talked certainly about geography and mental geography. But in international finance or global finance, it is extremely important. If you want to do a global deal on a day, you have to be, you have to have an entity in the North American time zone, you have to have one in, Euro in the European time zone, and you have to have at least one in the Asian time zone. Um, and at the moment, London is the leading center in the European time zone. Um, so if you're doing a global deal, not necessarily just an international deal, but if you're doing a genuinely global deal, um, even, you know, go and ask anybody in Frankfurt, they'll have to come through an office in London. And so the, being in the European time zone is incredibly important. Now, none of that's going to change after Brexit, even if there is a hard, a hard exit. 
Um, London's got, still got an awful lot of other things to offer. The institutions that are here, from Lloyd's, the Marketplace, the Baltic Exchange, 101 others. Um, all of the FX trading that goes on here, the commodities trading, um, nobody else in Europe is powerful enough to take over from London. They're just not big enough. And we employ more people in London in financial services than the entire population of Frankfurt. Um, so what, what, are, like, what are the don't, numbers don't, about it? Don't you see like a danger there if there starts to be like a downward trend that is very tough to reverse? Yes, I think. Because like look at Hong Kong, it's not like doing amazing. They can't um, sit on the laurels. Yeah. People are already moving away from London. That will continue. I don't think it'll. Um, but I don't. I don't see a mass exodus. I see a. Uh, decline, but I don't see a, ma because, a mass exodus. I could challenge you there that there's nothing unique in like the features that you mentioned that okay, you know, lots of people speak English, so that's, you know, like availability of talent. I mean, if you make it more difficult for talent to get here, it's not mm -hmm. going to help. That's also and, a big threat. And, and, and I think that, uh, and again, uh, uh, so, so I, I think, you know, like and the empire, I mean, that's like ages ago. Of course. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really like a big danger that uh, you take things for granted mm -hmm. that, you mm -hmm. know, of course, you know, like no matter what happens with Brexit, London will be OK. But I, I, I would be a lot more worried. I mean, and I'm not worried about Frankfurt. I mean, we're going to compete with those guys easily. But, 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 uh, <laughs> but I mean, like uh, there are there are lots of places that can actually scale. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like just in Helsinki sure. and Tallinn, we're going to add like just uh, along the tunnel 200,000, you know, new people. Mm -hmm. And we're bringing in like lots of students from Asia. And they'll, you know, speak fantastic English in no time. So, so, so again, I, uh, I, I uh, we're going to make it competitive. <laughs> I completely, it I completely accept your point, and I think the proposition you you have for um, Tallinn and um, and time zone wise, we're even yes, closer to Asia. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, you've got that. So, you don't want to get too close, or you're, you, there has to be working. But mm. no, that. Um, you cert we certainly can't sit on mm. our laurels, but I do believe... But, it, but it's a good list for us now, so now we'll check all the boxes. And, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Just need a bit more scale and we're there. <laughs> so, but, uh, Mark, Mark, like, it's interesting, I think the, the point that President Dilbert was making earlier about the birth of Silicon Valley, the sort of counterculture and all these things, like when I look at London, for me personally, and when I haven't been to London for a year, which occasionally has happened in my life, uh, then, then the things that I start missing are rather the things outside of tech and business, mm -hmm. like the the diversity, the, mm -hmm. the 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 I don't know arts and culture scene, the band that might occasionally be playing in a neighborhood club, which never would happen in a smaller place. And like, like look at the look at the top four financial centers in my index. It's okay. It's the way that we measure it, but it nonetheless, London, New York, Hong Kong, Singapore. What's similar about them? They're all very welcoming city. They're cities that are full of foreigners. <coughs> they're sit of cities that are talented and welcome. Um, and they're multicultural. They're cosmopolitan. They're wonderful, successful cities. Successful people want to live in successful places. Um, that's why we're talking or having this debate about um, city city versus state, if you like. You could only possibly be a standalone city. Even then, I, I still have my own worries about that. But you could only possibly be that if you were very, very successful. There are some successful cities out there, quite a number of them, and the Asian cities are becoming more successful. Um, they're also becoming far more welcoming and cosmopolitan. I mean, I went to Seoul seven years ago, and my first meeting with the uh, mayor of Seoul, um, he said, so how can we build Seoul as an international financial centre? I said, well, you've got one problem. It's not a terribly welcoming city. You know, I'm, man, I'm an Englishman getting off the plane here, and um, it's not terribly welcoming. And he said, oh, yeah, well, I have a problem there. My, foreign, my um, population don't like foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, had, he had accepted the point, yeah. and there has now been a seven-year programme in Seoul called Seoul International. You can now eat best Italian food outside Milan in, in places in Seoul, and the m international museums are fantastic, international health care, international schooling, expat community facilities. Um, it's come on leaps and bounds in seven years. I don't take a huge amount of responsibility for it myself, but it has, it's come on 
leaps and bounds. And I think, I think this is a fantastic example where when the Brexit news went out, the first thing the City of London did was the London Open for Business campaign. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So I think this, this sort of closed open dimension definitely is... Mm -hmm. is I, I, have another, I have another theory. Um, shoot me down in flames, but this is a little straw man. 10, 15, 20 years <coughs> ago, technology said that you could now trade on a stock exchange with a laptop and a satellite phone from the top of any mountain in any, any place in the world. And yet I believe cities are now more important than they were and will continue to be more important in the future. But I think the role of cities has to change with the technology. And I think the really successful cities of the future, it's only a theory, are the ones that will encourage and enable human interaction, face-to-face -face contact. Mm -hmm. It's all very well having video links and all the rest of it, and they're great, but I think the successful cities of the future, despite technology, will be the ones that occasion and enable people to meet and talk. I'm going to get geeky here on you, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to raise something that we could argue with because we've been agreeing far too much. Well, I would just say, I mean, this may bring things back to the state, but I would say that, uh, uh, and this is, I think, a big vulnerability of the UK at this time, uh, and especially the United States. Uh, but unless you, unless you uh, develop a, a strong, secure ID in the digital space, uh, you're, there, something bad is going to happen. All of IT today, or most places, are based on a model that was developed in the late 70s, early 80s, email address plus, uh, plus uh, password, which uh, worked fine when you, there was something called BitNet, which existed, you're, I guess we're of more or less the same age. We remember, BitNet was like this network of uh, academics, 3,500 people using you know, email address plus password. Today, when any password is brute force breakable, uh, I mean, you're just crazy to be using that. You do need a, a, a secure digital identity, two-factor authentication, end-to-end -end encryption, because otherwise, whatever you're doing, it's going to be broken. Mm -hmm. And no financial center that relies <laughs> on an old model of ID will be able to really function, I'd say, pretty soon. I mean, we already, I mean, Equifax in the United States and analogous break-ins like that with, with really bad security fundamentally resting upon an insecure identity uh, is something that, um, <clears throat> if it's not fixed, there will be disasters. Uh, and, there, and that's where the state comes in, too, because basically the state's about the only one that could actually enforce a very strong digital identity. I mean, the equivalent of a passport. You will need that in the future online. Now, that may, I don't want to get into all of that right now, but, or I don't have time, and you probably don't <laughs> care, but I would just say you, you really need to look at I, a secure digital identity for any place that wants to be a strong financial center in the future. Well, one of the things I mentioned when we were chatting earlier is... I've been researching financial centers for many years, and I've done not just the financial center index, but I've done all sorts of studies for local governments around the world. And there are all sorts of factors that, that um, make a center or break a center from the regulatory environment and tax levels and levels of corruption and human capital and education systems and the availability of skilled people and the um, flexibility of tax laws, and then there's the infrastructure, not just the built infrastructure, but transport and electronic, and on and on and on the list goes. But if I had to sum the whole thing up in one word, it's trust. And you need, to, if, if you're going to give your money to another centre to look out or look after, you need to be able to get it out afterwards, and you need to trust the people who work there. Now, of course, there are levels of corruption absolutely everywhere. You can't say we're as clean as clean can be, but um, there are levels. Um, and I know a lot of financial centres who said, right, we're going to start as a financial centre. The f first thing they do, they build shiny great chrome and glass towers. Um, then they turn around and worry about how the hell they're going to fill them. Um, 
you have to get a really good regulatory and trusting environment there to start with. And certainly I, um, ID and cybersecurity and all those things are, in this day and age, absolutely fundamental to that. I think that, uh, that uh, yeah, absolutely about trust. And I, I think that you have to kind of like be able to trust like the government. I mean, that's a pretty basic thing. But then also, uh, besides that, that, it has to be like very, very functional. And I think that, uh, again, if you look at uh, what's been going on in Estonia, uh, you know, fantastic kind of like uh, government services. And I, I think that, I mean, we have a bit of the same in, in Finland. I mean, I can file my taxes in a couple of minutes. It doesn't take me like two months and I don't need to hire like some kind of external consultant. So it's, it's like super, super easy. And, and I think also uh, there's a lot of value if you look at the physical environment that uh, how many meetings can you do in a day? You know, so, you know, if it takes you like two or three hours to go uh, from one place to the other, that also starts to have an impact. And, and I think that that is if you look at like a lot of the uh, cities in China, you look at a lot of the cities in India, uh, it's very, very clear that, uh, you know, it can take like forever to go from one place to the other because you're stuck in traffic. And, uh, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, not amazing. Okay, Moscow is another, like, probably has the worst traffic on the planet. And I think that there's a lot of these kind of things that uh, you really need to have uh, functional cities. Absolutely. And and I think that this is something, I don't know how that is, like, in your report, but I, I think that... Uh, infrastructure is... It's, like, it's super fundamental. Important. Yeah. Absolutely fundamental. I, did, I was at a restaurant today, and uh, via Uber, it would take me 16 minutes to get from the... A uh, restaurant to my uh, hotel and walking, it would take me 17. Mm -hmm. so. On that note, I trust, <laughs> I trust that you might have some questions using this opportunity of having the esteemed gentleman on stage. So there's one here. Uh, did we have a mic for? There were mics. Behind you. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, can you maybe introduce yourself as well? Oh, hi. Okay, my name is Lars. I'm from TransferWise and an Estonian. Uh, so I love, the, I love the panel. I love the discussion. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, I love the title of it as well. So it has two words with C, uh, cities and countries. But I wanted to ask about a, a word that also begins with the C, which is companies. So some of the companies out there have a customer base that is bigger than any of the countries out there. So what do you think is going to be the role of, of companies in the next 20, 30 years compared to cities and countries? Read The Guardian on Saturday <laughs> on Facebook, and uh, that's one, that's, I think that's... Uh, so what's the issue with that? What's the, what's the, like, if you think outside of the Facebook narrowly, what's the broader issue of the development of the rising strength of this companies as entities, if there is any? Well, ultimately, I would probably say you should read C.P. Snow's The Two Cultures, a 1959 essay, but on uh, the, the problem of what was, what was the problem of the university, but I think is today the society, problem of society writ large, which is a complete disjuncture between science and technology and ethics and the humanities, and which is, I think, behind much of the problem that we see today. And I see that as a fundamental threat to democracy. Uh, so, I mean, you have the yes, it's true. You have there are companies that are that are uh, larger than most countries in terms of GDP. Uh, I think that's uh, unregul. Uh, I mean, in unregulated form, I don't see that lasting. Uh, I think that we're we're going to see probably uh, probably. Uh, regulatory overreach is my prediction, simply because I think they've been so uncareful or so loose, fast and loose with ethics that uh, you will get a, a nasty response from the regulatory side, at least in IT. I mean, I don't know about other things, but at least if it's tech-based, and those are most of the companies that, in fact, have a huge, um, <clears throat> I mean, whose GDP is larger than, uh, than many countries. Uh, I mean, that's a whole different discussion. That, but I would just say that the role of companies, I think, is that uh, it's, it's vast and it's huge. And when it begins to tread upon, at least in uh, countries like the ones we're talking about, liberal democracies, that uh, they, they're already a threat in the way they've been behaving. And that their future, is, I think, will, 
be different. I mean, in a few hours, the uh, GDP, I mean, the G, well, the, the value of Facebook dropped 4.5% the last I looked, and that was about three hours ago. So I think that that will be changing. Peter, you, you've been dealing with some things like space exploration, infrastructure, mm -hmm. education, that all mm -hmm. 50 years ago were purely a government territory. Yeah, and I, I think that it's, it's um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree that there will be uh, new regulation coming in and probably also like uh, overreach in that area because uh, we're, we're already starting to see like a uh, backlash and, and uh, big reaction, you know, of course, like the Guardian article being a great example, but uh, again, uh, uh, people are starting to finally understand how powerful some of these players are and they are not very transparent. Mm -hmm. And I think that then, you know, like also uh, it's uh, not that long ago we had uh, the whole like uh, Snowden thing and there was actually a tweet by Snowden uh, today on Facebook that, uh, you know, they were very aware of what was going on for the last couple of years and then, you know, uh, unlike uh, some of the others, they've actually been making a lot of money on the back of, um, you know, people um, uh, meddling with uh, elections and, and stuff like that. So, so I think that, uh, yes, I mean, there definitely be like uh, a reaction. But then, then I think also uh, uh, it's not very simple because one thing here that uh, part of like the Snowden like things was also that you have then kind of like U.S. government insisting on various back doors and things and then uh, and, and UK too, and in UK, ha, you know, you have all this crazy discussion that oh, that you should ban like encrypted communication and like all this kind of like uh, uh, very misguided, uh, let's say, initiatives. Uh, so, so I think that uh, th there needs to be like a lot of discussion, and I think that uh, uh, I, I believe in education here. So, I mean, if people need to understand what is going on, because one thing here now there's a lot of discussion that oh, you had this like. Uh, you know, Cambridge uh, Analytica guys uh, grabbing a lot of like data and all of that. But guess what? There's a lot of private companies that are doing that like every day. And it's kind of like no big deal because nobody really understands what's going on. And it's not well, very... Not all, all involved in elections either. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But, but I, I think that, uh, uh, again, uh, that, that's one thing, at least uh, in, in Europe, we have some kind of... Uh, regulation in place when it comes to like data privacy and all of that. And I think that people are starting to understand that it's kind of important that uh, we have that. And I mean, again, uh, if, we, if we don't have identities for like everybody, then uh, yeah, I, I also totally agree that then, then you're really setting yourself up for like massive disaster. I think as a follow-up actually to your question, based on what you said, mm -hmm. is that in fact, I think some of the uh, <coughs> almost hysterical reaction to Snowden may be followed, which it dealt with uh, the government sector. I mean, sort of basically GCHQ and uh, NSA um, is now going to be, I think, repeated when it comes to the private sector. I mean, I think that, you know, the, uh, there's always an or this fear of this Orwellian state, but in fact, if you actually look at what NSA and GCHQ did, which was, uh, it's actually uh, far less intrusive. I mean, all they were looking is who was talking to whom, not actually not looking at, uh, at the content. Whereas what we see that Facebook did is looking at content. Uh, and that is something I, you know, will probably cause a snowballing effect. I mean, in the, I mean, this just came out the other day, and we had our suspicions, but 50 million users, that's quite a few people. Um, and all, everything about them, uh, from which you can predict things, as opposed to the metadata now, uh, collection uh, that we saw uh, under the Snowden revelations, looking at you know, connections between people, but not actually what it, who they were and in fact, NSA, you, NSA can't, doesn't know who it is that's talking. They just know that there's a node. Two nodes are connected. So I think that we could see something really big happening soon. But actually, it comes back to trust <coughs> again. I think this is also that if you have an uh, environment where you don't trust the government, it's going to be next to impossible to fix this. I think this is also something that... Uh, uh, you know, your question about like, okay, the public and private side and like education and space uh, exploration, what have you. I think that uh, we, we just need to figure out how kind of like the private 
and public sectors can work better together. I think that that's just uh, no way around it because it, it's uh, you can't really delegate kind of like the, the trust part. So it, it's going to be very interesting times. We have we have time for one more question, which I saw a hand back there. Hi, uh, James Oates from the British Estonian Chamber of Commerce. Quick advert, please talk to our CEO if you want to join. <laughs> um, um, it's interesting. Uh, I think another C uh, needs to be mentioned, which is culture. And I guess that brings uh, the trust thing forward. Uh, at one level, there are two cultural questions. One, uh, you can go to Luxembourg. It's a very interesting financial center, but very dull. Um, here in London tonight, uh, there will be more music concerts than in the whole of France. Um, so culture is a business that supports finance and interacts in a variety of ways. So we have soft culture. In Estonia, we have alive today uh, lots and lots of brilliant writers and poets. Um, and actually, that's what makes the place a cool place to be. Um, you can hang out in uh, Kalamaya with all the, all the funky kids. And, and Sten, obviously, as well. <laughs> uh, so um, I guess uh, thinking about the wider sense of the cities and the wider sense of culture, um, surely that's got to be the core of the, of the decisions that you're taking. And incidentally, I, I was in Hong Kong last week, and I don't buy the idea that China's seriously going to make it, because I think the 19th Party Congress, their culture, has led to something that's going to be a middle-income trap. And that's why in Hong Kong, they're kind of rubbing their hands together a bit. Uh, they've got a culture that works, and they know that the business culture in China doesn't work. Mark, do you have a comment to that? Only in that I agree with the vast majority of what you said. I think that um, cities, if you want to attract pe any international people, you have to be... Um, a nice livable place and culture to a lot of people is extremely important. I think there is also a business culture. This is very, going back sort of hundreds of years, but the basis of London was my word is my bond um, and you could do, do deals on a handshake. Now I know that was a long time ago, but nonetheless, the actual business culture is quite important. Um, but certainly the, the level of the arts, the level of, um, that happen in all these countries, um, the successful ones is what makes us or one of the things that really makes the city tick and I certainly don't exclude Tallinn from this I mean I think Tallinn's one of the European centres that is actually very pleasant to visit really pleasant to visit and very welcoming even to live <laughs> sorry even to live maybe. oh <laughs> <laughs> but anyway I haven't lived there I can't comment <laughs> But, I, but I, I think okay. uh, then on, on this, like on, on uh, the like uh, Hong Kong, uh, I think that uh, uh, I would be maybe a bit less kind of like bullish. I mean, it, Hong Kong, of course, is, is a great place. But if you look at what's happening right next door in Shenzhen and like the whole Greater Bay Area, uh, I don't think that uh, Hong Kong is on any kind of like upward like uh, trend. Uh, I think it's. Uh, totally the opposite and they need to figure out like how to fix that and uh, and I think that uh, uh, again uh, unlike what we are trying to do now and uh, are doing in Helsinki and Tallinn and bringing like people together bringing the cities together I think that uh, like Hong Kong and Shenzhen and if you look at like the whole that area that if they worked a bit more together they could do amazing things so we'll see kind of like what what happens but there's I mean, Shenzhen is, is uh, I was there kind of like the week before last, and I go there quite a bit, and I think it's a super young city, and, uh, and because of that, there's tons going on. And then, of course, the culture is different, so it's not like a Western culture, but it's definitely like very happening place, and it's not just the technology and the business and all that, but there's like culture, and I think that's why, why uh, they're doing, uh, you know, producing most of the hardware, like... Uh, planet and it, it's not just the tech it's it's kind of like the cultural side of things so so I think uh, uh, but yeah I, I think that uh, definitely uh, uh, we can't underestimate the the kind of like the importance of, of culture in all forms and shapes that's why I would say that I think the, the test will cover 2020 when the uh, social credit rating model becomes mandatory in China and that is basically a system of actually 
knowing everything about you through uh, sort of and big data analysis and right now I mean the system is voluntary and you get things such as your you get a, a rating based on what you say on uh, social media what your you know how your credit rating all kinds of things put together but with, and then that will, if it goes through in the current form, will determine if you have, the, you have a low social credit rating, and uh, that will determine whether you can, well, you're, the percentage of the loan you take, what, which hotels you can stay in, even whether you can go abroad. Now, if that is mandatory and implemented in an Orwellian way, that I think that the Chinese business model may have some problems attracting people. And then, but then in, against that, of course, when you have 1.3 billion, maybe you don't have to care about attracting other people. I don't know. But in any case, I think that what you say is right. Uh, but we don't, it's maybe a little too early to tell, but it, you could see again kind of a, a real, you know, hitting a blank wall uh, in 2020 if this thing goes in effect in an Orwellian way. And this comes back to like trust and all of these systems that if, if you think you're being followed, or if you're gonna, there are going to be repercussions in what you say and what you do, uh, as long as it's legal. But I mean, you get you, then I think that that is not that's kind of a, a good way to put a break on your economic development. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have, unfortunately, no, fortunately, we have a reception upstairs where we can continue asking questions in more personal setting. Uh, but unfortunately, we, we can't do them here in the audience right now. Um, thank you so much. I would like to so just to summarize what, what we've been discussing here. Cities matter. Nation states matter too, but they need to work in hybrid with the cities, which pull people and companies. Connections matter. Connections between individual cities for people to move around ideas, capital, all these things move around. London is ranking high but shouldn't take it for granted. Um, there are other places where interesting things are happening around the world and, and uh, this competition, as we know in private business, tends to push things forward, so it's a good thing for all. And I just wanted to leave you with one thing, why, why this competition, just to put some numeric value on this competition, is that at Moo Guys, uh, we, we help companies move people around and one of the things that, the, that my team built uh, a for a few years is, is a search engine that allows people to figure out where in the world they should live and work. From that, we have data on about 350, 400,000 knowledge workers who come there and they search. Like they say, what are the things they like and where should they go and all that. From that data set, uh, we know that the average salary of that knowledge worker is about $32,000 a year. Doesn't sound that high in London, but a global average. And Roughly, we estimate that there are about 350 million of those mobile, globally mobile knowledge workers seeking for the best place to thrive. And if you multiply those two numbers, $30,000 and 350 million uh, people, then basically there's $10 trillion on the move. And when a person moves or when a company moves and gets to a new place, that resets completely everything they spend. Like, Taxis go to a new place, the housing goes to a new place, the food goes to a new place, the schooling goes to a new place. And this $10 trillion is the name of the game. So I would <coughs> like to conclude the panel wishing London a lot of luck attracting their fair share of that. I would like to welcome LHV to London uh, and to spend more time with, with all of you and, and the, the first customers here and the future customers here. And I hope that uh, the city continues to be the cultural hub drawing everybody else here as well. So. Thanks, everyone.